Hello, I'm Natalie Lovgren with LPAC TV, and today we have Paul Gallagher with EIR here to discuss some of the questions that are, have come up around current financial policy. There's going to be an, a Federal Reserve Open Market Committee next week where Chairman Bernanke will discuss the next stage of QE3, which is the uh, QE4. So Paul is going to get into that, and then we're going to go through some of the lines, or shall we say excuses, that have come up on Capitol Hill about why we shouldn't restructure the financial system and why we shouldn't inst reinstitute Glass-Steagall. So, Paul, if you'd like to get into the, um, the issue of the, the Federal Reserve meeting this next week. Well, uh, we're coming to a turning point next week in a policy that's been going on for four and a half uh, years. Since the bank panic and the crash in, in uh, late 2008, the Federal Reserve has printed uh, and lo uh, loaned to the banks, primarily by buying securities from them. The Federal Reserve has printed more than two and a half trillion dollars. Uh, and the, cent the major central banks, the five big central banks in the world, have printed among them nearly 10 trillion dollars. Uh, and, you know, it's this is really what the, the inflationary uh, money printing that's going on. There obviously were tens of trillions of, of short-term loans in addition to that to the banks to bail them out on liquidity. But this is really just buying stuff from them, buying securities from them. Uh, so it's printing money and putting it in circulation and it's two and a half trillion and now it's increasing by about 40 billion every month under what the Fed is doing. And the uh, it's expected that at their meeting next week, uh, they're going to increase that net uh, printing of money to $85 billion every month. In other words, in 2013, print more, well over a trillion dollars. All of it going to large banks, most of it going to what are called the, the uh, primary dealer banks. The, they're now down to 18 because some of them went bankrupt uh, and were bought by others. But uh, those banks primarily are the beneficiaries of this constant buying of uh, both U.S. Treasury securities and these toxic mortgage-backed securities from the banks. Um, they're going to go to a rate of over a trillion dollars a year uh, for next year. And um, this uh, involves the Fed or will involve the Federal Reserve purchasing, according to a lot of estimates, well, well more than half of all the fixed income securities that are issued in the United States, in the entire economy. And in terms of the debt issued by the government, the Treasury securities, way over half, 75 percent or more of all of those will be bought from the banks immediately by the Federal Reserve as the Treasury borrows that money. So this is a, an absolutely extraordinary situation. Alexander Hamilton, in his national uh, uh, banking outline, his report to the Congress that founded the credit system of this country, one thing he prohibited was that the national bank would directly buy the debt of the government, right? Because when you have that, as you did in some European monarchies with, with like the British, the, the Bank of England, the, the uh, government can just indefinitely uh, print money for any purpose whatsoever, war or anything else, because it will all be bought by the bank, which was established by the government, and it's an inf effectively infinite process. And that's what the Fed is now going to be verging on well, it's, in it 2013. Seems, it seems that the way that they're looking at it, they're, they are thinking as an infinite process, but there must be some type of limit that we're going to reach, a, a physical limit. How far can this go on? They say that the, uh, that the uh, very fact that it isn't working, that is the banks are not lending it into the economy, they're not making real loans, they say that that very fact means that it isn't inflationary. Uh, that the banks are turning around and with the vast majority of this, both here and in Europe, they're turning around and investing the money right back with the Federal Reserve in what they call excess reserves of the banks. And the Federal Reserve is paying them interest since the crash for the first time in its history to put the money right back uh, and leave it with the Federal Reserve. 
So they're doing that, and uh, it's claimed by economists that this means the money isn't really going into circulation. It's just going right back to the Fed with uh, providing the banks with a profit, a, a double profit in the process, and therefore it's not inflationary. Well, at a certain point, it will trigger hyperinflation to do this. In Germany, the worst and most famous notorious case of ruinous hyperinflation in the 20s, there also was no inflation for several years after the German government started printing money to pay its external debt. Well, that money was not going into circulation in Germany. It was going to pay the foreign debt of Germany, so it was going abroad. And <clears throat> for that reason, uh, they appeared to be able to just keep printing and printing and printing based on a collapsing economy and no inflation until all of a sudden, one day, two years later, the inflation took off and then became impossible to stop and became uh, thousands and thousands of percent per month. Uh, this is given we have a dead economy in which, uh, you know, the jobs that are being created are generally part-time, they're generally low wage, we're not uh, creating uh, new platforms of infrastructure or manufacturing. Given that, this, uh, what the Fed is doing, they could easily by next year have uh, an asset book, in other words, have loaned out by buying these securities bigger than a quarter of the entire GDP, four and a half trillion dollars. And then they'll be in a position where they can't sell it. They can't return to normal condition because as soon as they start to sell it, interest rates will leap up and the Fed itself will become bankrupt. So they're, they're getting into a situation of uh, real uh, hyperinflationary potential combined with paralyzing the economy in the same way the the zero interest rate policy of the Bank of Japan for 20 years has been associated with a paralyzed Japanese economy because they cannot get interest rates to go up. They cannot get credit to go into the economy. It's simply uh, the zero interest printing of money continuously and, and the economy never responds. And so, you know, that's what the, that's what we're now are, getting are, to. Are we looking at at facing a situation similar to what happened in Germany. Uh, I remember reading stories about somebody going into a, a coffee shop and the, the barista telling them, if you, wanted, if you know you're going to drink two cups of coffee, order them at once because the price will go up by the time you get to the second one. <laughs> yes, this is the, <laughs> I've never heard that story before, but uh, this is, Immediately, the potential of, of what the Federal Reserve and the other central banks have been doing, the European Central Bank has printed its asset book is already way over $4 trillion. Uh, it's, it's built in waiting for a trigger event. In Germany, the trigger, in that case, the trigger event was, was the French military seizure of the uh, Ruhr and, and then a strike in response to that, which cut production suddenly and, and that triggered the hyperinflation, which had been waiting for two years to happen. But any time you have an economy which, in which the bank's bad assets are being protected by this kind of constant pumping of money into them by the Federal Reserve, by purchasing uh, the, everything the Federal Reserve is buying, they're buying from the same group of large banks. So that's pumping money into those banks who are not lending. Any time you have that situation, uh, hyperinflation is waiting to be triggered. And that's the only way to uh, cure the problem is to direct credit, to find a way to direct credit into the economy so that real new value, real new wealth is being created. And um, then you have to uh, reorganize those banks so that they can then lend and participate in, in that credit. Otherwise, it's going to be hyperinflationary. Yeah, well, I think it's clear to, to us here at LaRouche Pack that <clears throat> there, there needs to be a complete financial reorganization. But we're hearing a lot of excuses on Capitol Hill. And I wanted to throw out a few of these lines to you and see if maybe you could decode them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the top questions is, um, <clears throat> and, and one of the ways that they'll do it is put it in terms of wrong questions, and then you're you're confined within within wrong questions. One of the, the top questions is, what's the appropriate size of a bank? 
Well, I get that question also um, in, in the same place in Capitol Hill and elsewhere in Washington. The the point, the the, the crucial thing is this, not the size of the bank, but the function of the bank. Right. And re actual bank regulators who really regulate commercial banks understand this perfectly. That the point is not how big it is, but what is it doing, and what is it not doing if it's a commercial bank. And th the best. Uh, illustration of that is the fact that all of these banks are as large as they are because they have on their books hundreds of billions of dollars worth of overvalued securities. As soon as there was a reorganization like Franklin Roosevelt did in the bank holiday in 1933, as soon as those banks were uh, actually fully audited by auditors as if they were going to be closed down in order to see it, it, like the, the FDIC does every Friday with banks that happen to be failing. As soon as they uh, were fully audited and really uh, which, are, which assets are good, which assets are worth 50 percent, which are worth 20 percent on the market, you would suddenly find that these banks were much smaller. Mm -hmm. They would be sounder, but they would be much smaller, and that, that is what would define the appropriate size of that bank, but you have to then uh, you do that in the process of separating the functions of the bank so that th this is the Glass-Steagall Act, so that the uh, lending, commercial lending functions of the bank can then go forward with protection and deposit insurance and regulation. And the other functions which have been associated with this overvaluation, this blowing up the size of the bank, those are separated out and, and they have to survive or not on their own. Do, do we need do we need the, the so-called shadow banking industry? Um, another one of the, the axioms that, that is going around is that the, the securities industry, the financial services sector is, is necessary to provide a, um, well, that that must be tied to real commercial banking to, because the, the securities industry needs uh, to have a stable pool uh, of deposits available, and they're necessary because they act as insurance on real banking activities. Well, they don't, though. It's the opposite. It's the other way around. They, they aren't stable, and this became crystal clear when the bank panic hit in 2008. The, this large shadow banking system the, the biggest part of it is what they call money market mutual funds, so it's you can, you can that's several trillion dollars. It's worth looking at that. This, after Glass-Steagall was destroyed in the 90s and repealed finally in 99, the, the capital that was in deposits in commercial banks, a lot of it leaked in increasing amounts by lending over into the shadow banking system. The commercial banks simply then made loans to set up hedge funds, made loans to set up mutual funds, made loans to set up all kinds of uh, derivatives operations. The Federal Reserve of New York did a study which showed that in the case of Citibank, for example, a full third of all of its, its commercial assets went into this, into this kind of shadow banking. So since that's where the money was before, now the money came to be in the shadow banking area and Five years ago, uh, it particularly cities and states which had issued bonds, which had been bought by these shadow banking uh, firms of one sort or another, suddenly found that there's nothing stable about that sector whatsoever. Uh, that because those same firms were investing in all kinds of speculative securities, when those went bad, it meant that they pulled in their credit to everybody. and all the states, all the cities, all the agencies. This is what uh, led to them suing uh, over the LIBOR, the faking of LIBOR, because mm -hmm. the faking of LIBOR was being used by the shadow banking institutions of, of all different sizes in order to skim profits, basically. And um, the, the states and the cities and the authorities and so forth were the victims of this. And they suddenly found five years ago that there's really nothing there, or potentially, there's really nothing there, and they suddenly uh, no longer had the assets that they thought they had. So there's nothing stable about it, and it's 
it's not that it supports the commercial banking system, but rather that the commercial bankers, after Glass-Steagall was taken away, were tempted to pour their deposits into this shadow bank. We just saw it again with uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase adventures with their their big bets in uh, credit derivatives in London, where they lost seven billion dollars. That was the same mm. thing going on. Yeah. Well, uh, another argument is that the that companies wouldn't make risky ventures that are good for the real economy, that are uh, without the without hedging their bets, without having the backup of the the securities industry. Well, they often in in when Glass Steagall was when the banking system was well regulated, they often were uh, making those risky ventures with uh, loans from investment banks, but the difference was that the investment banks were lending their own capital. That is, their partners had put in capital and they were lending their own capital and therefore if it was really risky and if everything they were doing were, was risky, they were basically buying a bankruptcy for their own investment bank. So they had to uh, they had to study what it was that they were doing. The reason that um, particularly the British bankers and the Financial Times last summer suddenly came out for Glass-Steagall and they, they said one of the reasons was that when the investment bankers were able to go and instead run commercial banks, they then were no longer doing risky lending with their own capital at all but with all their depositors' deposits which were much vaster in scope and therefore, <clears throat> they could just rule the world with their speculative investments. If they went bad, they didn't lose anything personally. It's just that everybody else who had deposited the money lost. So that meant that the uh, to have the big commercial banks run by investment bankers was a disaster. So when we say Glass-Steagall has got to be done in order to generate actual credit for the economy, uh, we're not saying investment banks have to disappear because this kind of venture has been done by investment banks in the past, but that they have to uh, venture their own capital and they are not subject to government protection or guarantee. And how would you respond to the line that Glass-Steagall wouldn't have prevented the 2008 crisis because this was the banks such as AIG, uh, Goldman Sachs, Bear Stearns, uh, these investment banks um, failed because of the mortgage crisis and well again uh, it just isn't true um, and again you know serious bank regulators know this and say this that those uh, failures like Bear Stern Lehman most famously Lehman had been getting huge loans for several years from JP Morgan Chase uh, <clears throat> the, in other words the investment the the commercial banks had loaned tremendous amounts of their depositors' capital into the institutions which went bankrupt. Uh, in the case of AIG, AIG directly violated the Glass-Steagall Act by uh, buying a bank, an insurance company buying a bank, and then converting the bank into a hedge fund, a securities firm, uh, and locating the securities for firm offshore where it couldn't be regulated. This violated the Glass-Steagall Act just as much as the merger of Citibank and Travelers violated the Glass-Steagall Act. The, without this this flow of of uh, risky of capital becoming risky by being loaned from the commercial banking system into these securities operations of one sort or another, uh, you wouldn't have had the the uh, tinder for the crash. And you know, when, whenever anybody has looked at it seriously, that's clear. That was the case with Lehman. Lehman was blown up and supported in what it was doing by J.P. Morgan Chase and other banks. And uh, it was certainly the case with Bear Stearns. It was the case with AIG. Um, again, as I said, this the, the Federal Reserve itself did a useful study, the New York Federal Reserve, which showed just how much of commercial banks' capital flowed over into security speculation from 95 on, from the point that essentially Glass-Steagall had been rendered ineffective by Alan Greenspan refusing to enforce it um, and uh, up until 2011 it was tremendous uh, shift of capital from regulated loan capital over into speculative securities capital. Glass-Steagall has to be reenacted in order to 
stop that, that's what caused the government to have to bail the banking system out, to stop that bailout so that those banks can participate in, in actual credit. What do you think the effects would be of the proposed financial uh, speculation tax, the financial transaction tax? Is that... Um, well, I, I think th this is being put forward by a lot of people all of a sudden because of the so-called fiscal cliff nonsense, um, because what Obama is, is demanding in this increase in the tax rate for wealthy people is really going to generate, uh, even if it were done, it's going to generate a relatively very small amount of revenue for the government. Uh, <clears throat> nothing uh, comparable to the to the deficit reductions they want to make for no good reason whatsoever, but they're obsessed with making these reductions. So um, people to the left of Obama are not in the Democratic Party are coming and saying, well, we have a better, bigger tax, which if we really have this big tax on financial speculation, then we won't need to cut Social Security, we won't need to cut uh, entitlements like Obama wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're wrong. I mean, if, if such tax is put on, it will have the useful effect of drying up some speculation, but it's not going to produce much revenue. Right. This was, this the time for this was 20 years ago when Lyndon LaRouche proposed a speculative derivatives tax, specifically when the total derivatives bubble in the world was about $15 trillion. Now it's I don't, can't do the mul multiples that quickly. Now it's a quadrillion and a half instead. Uh, he proposed that tax precisely to stop it so that it wouldn't grow, to dry it out so that it wouldn't grow. If it had been done at that time, this whole massive uh, uh, tinder for the destruction of the economy, this derivative sector, wouldn't have grown up. Uh, but LaRouche said at the time, and Henry Gonzalez, the head of the banking committee at that time, who supported and tried to get this done in the in the House. They both said, this is not a revenue measure. This is not going to produce revenue. If we put it on, they're going to stop doing this, and that's the value. That That's what we're aiming for, is that they stop doing it. But now they're treating it as a source of revenue. They're saying this would provide $350 billion. Yeah. We could build infrastructure with this. But look at the, the effect of the LIBOR scandal. You had this at least a trillion dollars <clears throat> involved in this, so it's a delu it, it's like claiming that uh, that stock speculators are like smoking teenagers. That if you tax them, they're going to continue to smoke. They're just going to pay more for the cigarette. The the stock speculators are not like that. They're <laughs> going to find ways. If, if the thing says you, that you have to that that high speed trading has to wait two seconds before you can make a trade. They're going to design uh, uh, these, uh, uh, what do you call them, the computer software that can wait exactly two seconds and then make a trade in a nanosecond. And that will be faster than the one that waits two seconds and makes a trade in it. You know, it, they, they will simply uh, avoid uh, making trades subject to the tax. So that will be a useful function because those high-speed trades dominate the stock market now. But um, it's not going to produce revenue, and that's the problem with it. Uh, there's certain members of Congress who have the assumption that because money is so cheap right now, we can just keep borrowing and borrowing and then build infrastructure with, with that. What is, what is the problem with that argument? The problem is the Federal Reserve. It's the Federal Reserve that ha whose, whose money printing policy has been aimed at forcing interest rates on, on everything, really, but particularly on Treasury bills, down virtually to zero, which is what they were talking about in that congressional colloquy. Since the Federal Reserve, since the Treasury can now borrow virtually zero interest, why not just borrow, borrow, borrow a large amount of money and invest it in an infrastructure bank and, and uh, go to work building this infrastructure? The intention uh, of those members of Congress who were talking last week was good, but what they don't realize is the Federal Reserve has done this exclusively in order to provide uh, free credit to banks for the for the maintaining the value of the securities held on the 
books of those banks. The Federal Reserve is buying so much Treasury debt that it's virtually becoming the sole creditor of the Treasury. Remember, we were saying next year it may be buying 70 percent of all the debt issued by the federal government. Um, that And that creditor, the only one around, is coming to Congress and saying, cut, cut, cut. You have to cut expenditures. We're doing everything we can, says Ben Bernanke. We're, we're keeping interest rates at zero forever. But we can't do it forever. You know we can't do it forever because there could be an explosion. So you have to cut, cut, cut. That's the problem with what these congressmen are. Their intention is good, but they don't realize that the, uh, the Federal Reserve System is doing this for the banks and will not do the same thing for the Treasury. That, in effect, it's created a bubble in Treasuries where the interest rates are virtually zero. The value on the market of these Treasury securities keeps going up. Everybody's speculating in them. Uh, I mean, all the banks are speculating in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Federal Reserve is supporting that. But it will not support just direct infrastructure borrowing, but it instead is going to the Congress almost as the sole creditor now and saying, cut, you have to cut. So, um, and, and also government revenues are very, very low now as a proportion of GDP. They're historically very, very low. Uh, it's been clear throughout this whole period since the crash that the economy will not restart itself. And now it's becoming uh, very, very clear that the U.S. has a real uh, intense problem of crumbling infrastructure nationally that in particular with regard to weather, with regard to the intensifying drought, the loss of major river navigation, the loss of agriculture, the, the real uh, <coughs> disappearance of our major crops so that we, we have no corn reserve, we have uh, a very seriously uh, threatened winter wheat crop on top of very bad crops last year. We have a real uh, emerging food and food price problem as well as uh, infrastructure that was completely slammed by these storms. We have to invest in a new infrastructure platform above all uh, to handle water management across the whole of the North American continent as, as we proposed with the North American Water and Power Alliance. And the only way to do that is by direct generation of national credit, either through a national bank where the government invests, both capitalizes a national bank and invests government revenue in it temporarily uh, while it's in, until it needs to be used. And then the bank attracts uh, other private capital to leverage that and invests in infrastructure. That was the way, that's the pre-Andrew Jackson national credit system of the United States, which functioned extremely well from uh, from 92 to uh, 1792 to 1812 and then again all through the 1820s and 1830s until Jackson destroyed it uh, and destroyed it to such an extent that now people tend not to have any real memory or idea of the national bank <coughs> or national credit as an asset of the United States but that's what we were built on. We do it that way or uh, as a transition, we do it in the way that Roosevelt did by creating a, a financing agency which financed itself with treasury guarantees and, and uh, drove the whole economy for 20 years. We do it the way Lincoln did it by reorganizing the banks and then printing the, the greenback issues specifically for infrastructure and for uh, military expenditures. If we do that, uh, then <coughs> all we have to do with the banks is reinstate Glass-Steagall so that, I mean, most of this we've already discussed, so that the, the speculative part is put on its own and the commercial banking is restricted back to what commercial banking is really needed for, which is lending into the, into the uh, real economy. Um, that's the purpose of uh, doing a Glass-Steagall reorganization now. We have to create jobs and we have to, obviously, uh, rebuild our our infrastructure on a new, uh, higher technology level. So um, <clears throat> if we do that, the Federal Reserve theoretically can do it. 
but it won't. I mean, if, if such a, if a R, new RFC were created at this point in order to uh, build new infrastructure, theoretically the Federal Reserve could stop buying all these toxic securities from the major uh, dealer banks and instead buy the, the debt of that reconstruction finance corporation. But by policy and by uh, intention, the Fed will not do that. It exists to lend only to those major banks and has done that for 100 years. When Ben Bernanke was asked about uh, the Federal Reserve buying uh, municipal bonds, state and city bonds, to enable them to make such investments, he said he wasn't sure if the Federal Reserve was allowed to do that under law and it did not intend to do it in any case. This was in congressional testimony. So the, the, the Fed is, a, is a completely an animal which o operates in completely different opposite direction. We need to create uh, at least national credit institutions or a full national bank in order to do this and then stop the Fed completely from printing this money. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, for being here. Thank and you. And thank you for watching. And stay tuned to Lurish Pack. We'll see you soon.